banditos welcome to the latest friday episode of the dollar bin bandits on this september 30th i am joe marcello i'm Warren phillips i'm mike farrah it's the last day of the work week it's the last day of september and it's the last dollar bin bandits of the month but have no fear we're going to make the end of the month a little less painful and uh we're gonna help you usher in the weekend and the month of october with one of our fantastic interviews and uh, no better way to do that than with our interview, or more specifically, Mike and Oren's interview. I couldn't make this one, unfortunately, with Jamar Nicholas. I really enjoyed this interview. Um, I didn't know too much about Jamar prior to uh, this interview. Uh, I was familiar with the work he did on uh, one of Kevin Smith's old websites. Uh, so I found this, this interview particularly insightful and really interesting. T- and I realized that he is like the master of independent comics. Yeah, my, uh, I got my kids uh, the first Leon book a couple of years ago, and my daughter read it, and she loved it. And, you know, I always kind of kept, you know, an eye on what was going on. And I saw this new book coming out. I thought this would be a wonderful time to, to speak to him. And uh, such a cool guy, really laid back. Um, you know, uh, the scholastic uh, graphic novel scene is really blowing up. It's one of the biggest comics uh, publishers in the world, and, and he's right in the middle of it. I love talking to Jamar. Uh, I was also not super familiar with his work before doing the interview, but in doing my research and really digging in with him, I loved hearing about you know how he came to cartooning and the way he's kind of weaved uh, through different um, formats for his work. I particularly loved uh, talking to him about his graphic uh, novel adaptation of Fist, Stick, Knife, Gun, which is a memoir written by um, uh, Jeffrey Canada, who uh, is a large, looms large in New York education. And also Jamar is uh, big into teaching as well. And I really love that about him and that he, you know, makes education a priority as well. So let's get to, let's hear from the man himself. This is Jamar Nicholas. Hi guys. Uh, Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to talk to you today. Thank you. Really excited to have you. So uh, we're going to start off as we do uh, with our typical first question, which is how did you discover comic books? So um, I may have been five, six years old, something like that. Uh, I'm from West, I'm from West Philadelphia. The Will Smith jokes. We'll do the rap at the end. Yeah, we'll sing the song. (laughs) Um, And I was primarily a a giant fan at that age of the newspaper comics, the newspaper strips. I was a, I was a funnies guy. Um, but the corner store, as they call them here in Philly, they call them bodegas everywhere else in New York, um, started carrying a three pack of comics in a cellophane bag with the covers ripped off. And I, it may have been, what, 50 cents, something like that. This is the 70s. So. And um, I would pick those up. And sometimes there were Spider-Man issues in there. And sometimes I don't even remember what the other things were because it wasn't Spider-Man. I wasn't interested. And I just I fell in love with with the the storytelling and the artwork and for a long time i didn't know that there were other people that drew the stuff and it just it just kind of appeared in a bag and i read them uh also the uh digests if if you guys remember that kind of like at the supermarket there'd be like a like a thick marvel digest and you know i would uh, read those and actually like draw in them. I remember I would like fill in gaps at Dicko <laughs> left on some characters. I, don't know, I was like, oh, he missed a spot. Oh, he doesn't have the webs under his armpits this time. Let me draw those in. So that was that was the beginning of my love of comics. I'm a, Mar- I'm a Marvel guy. That's great. Um, I, I read from your profile that you studied animation in school. And um, I'm wondering whether you gave thought to or pursued that before you got into comics and if not why um why comics over animation well this is this is a really interesting uh side <laughs> sidebar of this uh, i i did study animation i was a big fan of cartoons in early anime they didn't call it anime back then it was just what was it it was star blazers that's what it was it didn't have another name um but by the time i got into college and having a pick a major i went into animation because I wanted to always do comics in some fashion. Uh, and I had this thought in the back of my head that at some point, something I'm going to do is going to get made into a cartoon. And I want to know how to, I want to be able to direct it. That was my whole, I had this weird right. thing in the back of my head all the way back then. I didn't necessarily want to be an animator. I never wanted to be an animator. I, did, I didn't love the, you know, the draw, the flip, the whole thing, or the, you know. 
and mess my wrists up. But I always wanted to, I was always looking towards the back end of production and be making sure that uh, my voice was heard. So I wanted to know, I wanted to make sure I knew how to speak the language. You wanted more control yeah. over your form of art. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. And I would tell people that in school, they're like, what? I don't know what you're talking about. So I kind of kept that part to myself. <laughs> you know, I had a mission. Right. And when you got the chance and wanted to put together a book, how did uh, Leon come together? Um, well, Leon is probably one of my newer uh, projects, but it's old. Like uh, I came up with Leon. It had to have been like 2004 or something like that, maybe a little earlier than that. Um, but the way Leon kind of came about was <clears throat> I had a very one my first thing that I self-published back in 1997, 98 was called the Jamar Chronicles, which was very it's weird now you talk everybody knows about Rick and Morty, right? But I was doing like this dimensional hopping stuff. Uh, a, a while before then and I, I was always interested in that so one of the universes he was going to me meaning him meaning me <laughs> i don't want to confuse anybody too much uh was in this universe where uh he wound up uh getting helped by this kid who was basically like a robin character like a you know ward of this superhero guy who kind of is some daddy issue stuff uh this guy went out to get some cigarettes or get a carton of milk and he never came back so the story in my head was what what happens when robin like you know young like uh you know young robin is stuck in a bat cape and doesn't know how to work the stuff like he can't drive he can't use the batmobile you know alfred's not around so i kind of just like tuned into this thing where it'll be interesting to see what a kid would do in a situation like that. So that was the opportunity to do a comic strip in kind of like a, a um, kind of like a new uh, a coupon a coupon magazine. You know when you go to the supermarket and they have the basket with <laughs> with the you know the clipper and all those kind of things. A buddy of mine uh, was was editing this one magazine called Delaware County Magazine, and he said, "Yo, I want to do a comic strip page. You know, let's do a funny page." And I was like, "Yo, that's right up my alley." So I gave him Leon. And the, and the story of Leon then was I got rid of the like the uh, absentee father part, <laughs> I kind of buried that. And I just did a comic strip about a kid who's a superhero who doesn't want the attention. You know, so he didn't want the fame and that ran for a year. But the funny part was that I the, the, the magazine came out every month. So I was doing a four panel strip monthly and it was really hard to tell a story like that so that was kind of the genesis of leon and then uh when i got the opportunity to make a full-blown graphic novel that's where i went and that's the elevator i've been on for a while now with leon hope that wasn't too long you guys i run my mouth oh it's interesting and i <laughs> you know as someone you know my kids read the book and they loved it and i read it with them what were some of the characteristics that you wanted to put into leon as a lead in the book? Well, that's a good question. And I, what I think is really funny is I think, because I'm going to talk about race a little bit, not too much. I think there's an assumption that to have a character like this, that there's some sort of weird agenda in it, or it's like, can I give this to my kid? Like, I'm, I'm a, I don't know what's going to happen when I turn to page 18. And, you know, just the focus of all of my, my work has always been just to create characters that, or engaging that people can connect with. He just happens to be a black kid, right? Right. So, uh, really, one of my, the first things that I was always thinking about is how to kind of diffuse that uh, little kind of like mental bomb that's 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 counting down in some people's heads. Um, and you know, once in a while, I would get somebody who would come back from reading the book. This is protector of the playground we're talking about, and go, "Oh, wow, that was really good. It's not what I was expecting." but I'm not exactly sure what you were expecting. You know what I'm saying? So there's like, you know, there's a couple of walls we have to knock down. And uh, probably one of the biggest things that I have been campaigning for as I've been doing this work is to study a couple of things. One of the first studies I'm, I'm always considering is what it felt like to be an 11 year old. And, you know, and that's kind of that weird tweet, they call them tweets now, area where you're still like kid stuff, but then all of a sudden you have a personality that you're trying to explore and it's like, oh, I'm going to wear this hat. 
uh, I don't know. I, I just, I just like it. And you know, now you're weird. You smell weird. It smells funny. And, and I wanted to kind of call back to that feeling of not really being sure of yourself, but also all of a sudden people expect things from you. You know, uh, your mother expects you to take out the trash and clean, clean off the table. And you're like, I don't want to do any of this stuff. Why do you want this for me all of a sudden? So I'm peppering all of these emotions into the work. And then also, um, this is very like academic. I always, always wanted to kind of bring it back into a, a, a sense of play and imagination. Like, you know, Leon's look is very like day one cosplay, you know, he's got a tablecloth on his, around his around his neck and he has uh, dishwashing gloves on and a utility belt. Like, you know, that's your Dollar Tree superhero right there. Um, and I wanted them to feel accessible like that, like anybody could be Leon. And um, so I feel like I've been hitting a lot of those notes uh, lately in the work. So that's really what I'm always trying to get. I'm trying to go for and not agenda message, but also making him accessible to people who can recall their childhood. And, you know, not to, to get ahead, but I know there's other Leon projects in the work. Yeah. When you're doing a project with a, a child, um, you know, center figure, do you plan on aging him with each mm. book? Or do you keep him at the stage? Do you think with aging him, it's different things he's coming up against, but there might be a limit to how far. Yeah, go. that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> I've, you know, I've, when I was a, a young kid and I was uh, kind of deconstructing comic comic strips, I was always upset that the characters never changed their clothes. Right now, as a cartoonist, like I understand why they don't change their clothes. I don't want to have to figure out another way to draw this kid. And, like Jughead wears, you know, the the sweats, the sweater with the S on it, and he's got the the hat. You know, that's Jughead. Um, with his age, um, there's been a couple of iterations. He has kind of just like slid a little bit between like third to sixth grade. And I've kind of kept it right in there. And I'm not really interested at this point to go much further. Because I think once you start going a little further, you start getting the puberty stuff. And then it's like, oh, well, does he like girls or does he like boys? And, you know, and it's like, that's not really the story I'm interested in. Um, I would even leave it up to the readers. They can figure that out or make their own, <laughs> you know, make their own comics. Um, uh, uh, their, what do you call it? Slash fiction or whatever. Like, I'm going to make up my own stories about Leon. But right now, I like I like the age he's at. I don't really have a story in my head of teenage Leon or adult Leon or something like that. Um, because I feel like this this period that I'm dealing with with him is so special. And I see so much stuff out there that's kind of like shooting past that age. You know, it's like, oh, well, that's boring. Let's get to like when he, you know, he's looking at girls and stuff. Like, you know, I'm not trying to be Judy Bloom over here. <laughs> I, I have my lane that I'm trying to I'm trying to work in. I hope you don't mind us kind of skipping around. Uh, your no, that's how my brain works. Going from your that. most your most <laughs> recent to, you know, one of, I think, probably your, your formative and certainly award-winning experiences, which is the adaptation of Fist, Stick, Knife, Gun. Yeah. Um, how important was that project to you personally, but also as a step in your sort of artistic and creative evolution? Oh, thank you for that question. Um, it was it was very very it was it was, it was almost like a, a a milestone or a fork in the road. Or I'm trying to figure out a good way to put how important that project was to me. Um, on a couple of points, if you'll uh, humor me for a second, I'll go through some of them. On well, one of them was just a career milestone because um, the the project came about uh, not that I was chasing it down. As a, as a lot of freelancers know, like you're always trying to find the next gig. I'm trying to find this next opportunity. Hey, do you know anybody who needs their car detailed? You know, whatever, when you're in that hustle mode, you're like, I got to find some work. And this was the beginning of a space for me when people were coming to me, which was, you know, that was mind blowing. You know, you hear those stories about, you know, uh, somebody gets the call and you don't believe it at first. You're like, Johnny, stop playing on my phone. And you like hang up the phone. Like, no, that was that was really Joe Casada. Like, oh, shit. <laughs> really? <I'm sorry. laughs> you know, let me call him back. It wasn't to that degree, but it's kind of like, well, now, you know, your name is getting out there and people know about you and all the things you've been working for are actually starting to work, which is something that we're not really used to, you know, so. That was a big thing. The other thing was the content of the book. 
uh, the story quickly is about the um, the upbringing of this uh, man Jeffrey Canada when he grew up in the fifties and the sixties in the South Bronx. And what makes the book so timely is that we are completely in the same space socially, as far as how um, kids are growing up around violence and how a lot of ki- inner city kids kind of their minds kind of get warped into being violent to solve their problems, and you know. It kind of, it's a, you're being a, pro, a product of your environment is a real thing. So what I took that on when I read the, his memoir was like, oh man, I went through the same stuff growing up in Philly in the 70s and the 80s. And this was like 20 years ago. Nothing has changed. Actually, it's gotten worse. So, you know, I took that on as a, as a challenge to try to at least document this one person's story. And maybe that would help. Uh, people out in their own lives and start to change the narrative. Uh, And also from a business standpoint, where not to talk ill of that project, but it it wasn't the best deal. Um, It was a take it or leave it deal. Uh, And some things started to become really clear to me is that if you're going to be in this book space doing, you know, like we call it book world, like book publishing and things like that, you need, you need representation, like you need an agent. Not to say that you can't do things without it, but you kind of need an agent. Let's just, be, <laughs> let's just be real. So, you know, I took this deal. I knew I could not take it. And I kind of, I did it. I paid the price. And now the thing exists out in the world, which I'm very proud of. But I learned a lot more about how to uh, do business moving forward. So, yeah, it was a very, really pivotal thing for me. Had you been interested um, in biographical or, or true life comics before that, or was it just this particular story that spoke to you? And second, would you do another biographical project? Uh, uh, yes, to all those things. Uh, bef- around that time, this is around 2009, 2008, 2009, um, I, was, I was really into journal comics, uh, like James Kolchaka's uh, 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 diaries and then uh, Drew Wing, who had just had uh, he was doing a daily comic journal of just his life in Savannah, Georgia. And there's right. his girlfriend, and there's his roommate, and they're going to go get pizza tonight, and maybe I'll print some comics. Like all that stuff was really fascinating to me, just from a storytelling point of view. And uh, some of the graphic novels that were coming out around that time, like probably um, Fun Home, was probably the biggest thing at that time. I found was really exciting just from the standpoint of people being bold, brave to tell stories in the space. And that was still new, right? It wasn't like, oh, you know, you go to Barnes and Noble and there's a whole aisle of this stuff. It was just a couple of books. And I've always been somebody that talks too much, <laughs> as you can probably see from our conversation. And there are things where I felt like, you know, there are spaces where you can talk and tell people things from, you know, when you grew up or like, oh man, you won't believe the story. And people kind of don't really believe it. But when you put, when you put it down on paper and then kind of step away from it, it kind of changes the conversation where people go, oh man, you know, they're connecting to it in a different place uh, versus you kind of just like telling them this wild story that you may have been making up. So, you know, I was very excited about that part of the art form and wanted to, explore it further and i you know i have a couple of memoir things in my in my uh head too one of the things that i've heard from other cartoonists in the past is like why would i do that nobody i'm boring who would want to read my story and i think everybody has a story in them at least one so um i think it's even interesting that i could maybe do one or two things you know Uh, if you want to talk about this aspect of being i don't know like a black male who lives in this in this century? That's a thing. You just want to talk about, I don't know, diabetes. We can talk about that. You know what I mean? Or growing up with a single mother. That could be a whole other thing. So, you know, I think it's a really rich way of telling stories. I agree. Uh, I'd love to see more from you. Thank and you. I, I do like the genre as well. And I think it has sort of come into its own yeah. lately. Uh, mm-hmm. Again, with Fun Home, um, a number of other comics are just the names are not coming to my head, but I've right. enjoyed virtually all of them. And yeah, their stuff may not be happening. I mean, when you have the scale of, you know, superhero comics, 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it, real life in any any uh, flavor will be sort of a letdown in terms of the action. But I right. mean, there's just so much more uh, uh, to comics as a storytelling genre, you mm-hmm. know, yeah. or not yeah. a genre, right? It's as a storytelling tool. Right. Um, so anyway, that's that's sort of me and my soapbox. I, I encourage you to <laughs> continue and I like to read that. No, thank you. I appreciate um, that. I wanted to move to... A, a very different. I, I mean, there are you know threads of similarities that go through these, but a, a different mm-hmm. project, um, more fun, I guess, uh, which is Detective Bogaloo. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I um, what you know was that a sort of long gestating character and strip, or did that just kind of come to you at some point and you're like, I, I got to get this out yeah. and uh, do some fun stuff with uh, hip hop. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, and I, I have to applaud you guys for doing homework. This is great. Um, we try. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. And, and it's and it's hard because it's, start, it's starting to get hard to find that stuff online. Like yeah. it's really fragmented or you it's almost like a, a you had to be there era of the Internet. Those things are just not around anymore. Um, well, real quick, just to kind of give a, a, a baseline for what we're talking about. So Detective Boogaloo Hip Hop Cop uh, was a webcomic I started doing for the filmmaker Kevin Smith. Uh, this is 2002. And um, I think, was it Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back? I don't know if there's any Kevin Smith fans uh, who are listening to this. Um, but there was a part of this movie where the whole plot of this thing was that Jay and Silent Bob were going to go visit all of these internet nerds who were making fun of them on his website and punch them. That's the premise of the movie. So they decided to actually make the website that people were going to. So uh, I was part of a web comic portal on there. Uh, and there's some other like big, big names on that were on there now, like Chris Ryle, who was my editor, who was the editor in chief of IDW for a really long time. He just stepped down, was my editor. We were all babies then. <laughs> and um, uh, Ryan Otley uh, was doing a, a strip there. You know, like it was really in- an interesting test kitchen. Uh, but basically the, the premise was that there was this guy, James Lee Boogaloo, who was a B-boy in the 80s, and he wound up breakdancing on some radioactive cardboard and fell into a coma. <laughs> as it, one does. As one does. It happens all the time. <laughs> there, should, there should be, I don't know, a community about that. And um, <laughs> he wakes up in the, in the mid-90s to find out that his brother Ice Trey has become a super-powered rapper and has taken over the city. So he has to basically join a police force to bring him down. And it's a very Cain and Abel uh, 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 love letter to hip hop thing that I created there. It was a lot of fun. I still have people that ask me about it. Uh, it, came, it wound up in a couple of different iterations because I did the strip for a couple of years and then I kind of put it down. And then in 2015, I was approached by the U.S. Metro News Service. Um, if you live in a city where you go to the subway and there's just like a free paper box before you go down into the tunnel, uh, the Metro is one of those and it's a daily color paper. So I started doing Detective Boogaloo as a daily comic, color comic strip. And I kind of got a chance to kind of retell that first arc of the story I told with Kevin, uh, where I could kind of slow it down a little bit and kind of open it up a little bit more uh, than I had in the past. One of the funny things, you guys, about that is Time passed from 2002 to 2015, where now all of a sudden there's Twitter. Twitter wasn't around in 2002. And, and uh, I don't want to get with a soapbox, but I, I felt I, I started to see that context has been lost. I think we lost context a long time ago. So I was getting some really negative feedback on Twitter about my newspaper strip as people didn't get it or what what exactly is going on here i don't like these images of black people that you're doing i'm just like did you read it and i think every cartoonist will just say well did you read it i don't think you read it (laughs) so you know that also started to tell me that you know i have to not to be more conscious of what i'm doing because that was never the intention to do like you know I don't know, like jarring work, because I don't think what I was doing was that jarring. It's just that there are people that aren't paying attention to how things are supposed to be produced. When you do a strip, even if people read comics, uh, newspaper comics at all anymore, is you expect it to be Garfield, right? Like people don't read Prince Valiant 
if they do read Prince Valiant and they go, but that's not funny. I hate this. <laughs> you know, well, you know, we're, well, why isn't this hilarious? This isn't this the comments. So I was butting up against that too. You know, uh, the, the language has changed. And if I bring Boogaloo back, I'm a, I don't know how it will be perceived now. You know what I mean? I would probably advance the timeline to present day, but I don't think people could just, you know, read it and go, oh, I, I get it. This is satire. That's a whole, I, I don't mean to go yeah. on a rail there. No, but. I mean, <laughs> I feel like with the introduction of social media or, or rather the rise of social media, everything has yeah. become so reactionary and yeah. to your point, devoid of context. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and I think that's sort of one of the, if I get on my soapboxes, <laughs> one of the limiting factors of a place like Twitter is you only have so many characters. And so it doesn't give you mm -hmm. the opportunity to mm -hmm. make any kind of nuanced article yeah. um, argument. Yeah. rather. And, you know, and to that, um, I've also I don't know. I, I don't know if this is different for people who've grown up like you. You came out of the womb and started using an iPad like um, we're not um, we're not from that era. Uh, but to me, it started making me think about how I just have to, I don't know, kind of like steer what I'm doing to make sure that there's an access point for people who aren't an old guy like me. You know, like I don't want to be the, you know, <laughs> yelling at the clouds old man guy, but also know that there are people who don't. I just <laughs> you guys, this is great. I just saw this. I think it was a reel or a TikTok where somebody was explaining um, I'm a video game guy who's like, this is a GameCube. And back in the day, we used these little little boxes they're called memory cards and you would put it in there and it would save your game and i was like well how old are we now that people don't know what a memory card is but you know the timeline is moving ahead and you know i don't know don't get me started <laughs> i think we're all, all feeling like we're getting left behind <laughs> yes <laughs> like really is that where we're at now okay but yeah uh, i hope that answers yeah, your question thanks very much <laughs> okay <laughs> Uh, you're right. Right now, the, the graphic novel, especially the kids' graphic novel market, is absolutely booming. Um, I saw somewhere that it's Scholastic is outselling Marvel and DC as far as, you know, technically comic books go with these graphic novels. Yeah. As someone in the middle of this, uh, how have you seen the growth in all this time? Uh, I, you know, I find it, it's, it's, it's my, it's not mind boggling. It's very eye opening. And I think because I've been dabbling in this world for a while, I get it. And I think not to be too like, you know, <laughs> ostracizing here. I think a lot of comics readers don't see this other side of the road. You know, it's very easy to look at the success of Dave Pilkey at, from somebody who has a pull box with flash and green arrow in it and go, what is that garbage? You know what I mean? It's like, this guy can't even draw. What is, you know, what, is, and just kind of like shut it off, right. you know, or people who don't know who Raina Tagelmeier is, you know, it's just kind of like being a cartoonist and being a fan of cartooning should, you know, at least make you aware that this is going on and that, that kids are interested in it. So, you know, I feel like I'm kind of in the middle of a middle of a railroad, <laughs> right? Where I see what's going on in, in kid lit and the book publishing world and hoping that the comic side can, I don't know, maybe, I don't want to say catch up. That's not what I, what I want to say. Want to like maybe embrace it in a better way. Like going into a, a comic book shop, it's very rare that a comic book shop has a really good setup for kids. You know, there might be like, you know, that, that rack towards the door where the old bubblegum machines are. And there's some Archies that are sun, you know, sun bleached over there. It's like, you got anything for kids? Uh, yeah. There's some Sonics over there. They're not super interested in that. You know what I'm saying? But you're starting to see that change a lot. And I think it's for the benefit of, sorry for the dog, <laughs> the benefit of the art form and the benefit of the hobby for us to make sure that kids are getting comics you know or getting into the comic book store and when they go there they don't get told they should just go to the go to barnes and noble because we don't carry that stuff you know what i mean so i just hope to see a better marriage of the two worlds coming coming uh down the road how do you write for children that's not above their heads but also you know not below them not insulting their intelligence that it's something that they can relate to and it's something on a yeah. reading level that's going to help them uh, that's you a, know that's a, that's a good question I think what helps me is that um, I, I wonder if people say this because we're all comic book geeks in a way. Oh, I'm a big kid. I'm, a, you know, I never grew up. I'm a big. I don't. I think it's a little more nuanced than that. 
I think I'm very in touch with my imagination and that that part of wonder as a child, which I think gets lost the longer you know we you know, the longer we're around. And I think the successful kids authors know how to tap into that. Uh, I've seen people or had conversations with people go, oh, you know, I I made this book this picture book about brushing your teeth and it's very like one two three ABC. Oh. My teeth hurt. You should brush your teeth. Brush, brush, brush. And I was like, come on. Like, when you were a kid, you didn't want to read that. You know, or even, I don't remember when we were in school, if you ever got that comic book with a toothbrush and that little that little pill that turns your teeth green. You know, like that whole, that whole thing was really corny. Yeah. But if somebody was like, oh, yeah, I remember getting that stuff. Let me try to write it in a fresher way. I think that stuff would, would, would connect with kids. Kids are a lot smarter than we give them credit for when you were a kid you were probably like i'm smarter than everybody in this room right now they just don't want to hear what i have to say right so i try to re remember that all the time is that it's not brush 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 one two three it's kind of like i want to just tell stories that kids can relate to because i remember what it felt like to get talked down to or not to be taken seriously as much as a kid could be taken seriously and i, I live right in that in that pocket right there I want to kind of be a voice to them. Now you've done um, a lot of teaching uh, as well as creating. Um, you know, what, what is, how important is teaching to you and, you know, your career and identity? And, you know, are, are you, will it always be a part of your life? Are you always going to be doing something uh, with education? Um, I, I, you know, it's funny, I had just been thinking about this a while ago, and I think what's kind of kept me young, in a way, is that I've had at least some sort of spoke wheel connection to kids, or the kid world, I'll call it kid world, uh, even if it's just language, or if it's like slang, or it's just like, you know, the way kids carry themselves, or dress, or what they care and don't care about. I've always kind of been around that to a degree where I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, there was a period in times, probably a couple of years ago, when I used to teach a lot of summer youth program programs uh, downtown at some art schools. So you would kind of get this different kind of energy of, of kids that would show up just for the summer because they're too young to be there for school who come from all over the city to take a cartooning workshop, fourth to sixth grade. And they all kind of like basically dump these kids into a room. And I'm just like, uh, all right, how am I going to make this work? If some kids don't want to be there, right? Remember that? Here, <laughs> sit here. I'll come get you at five o'clock. But mom, I want to go with you. What am I going to do with this kid? You know, or the kid that just draws SpongeBob and he doesn't want to draw anything. And like, I'm basically, you know, dealing with these, these broken Lego box of pieces that don't really fit. So... Being able to speak the language and sometimes just connecting like, oh, so you guys, somebody brought their, their binder of Pokemon cards. Oh, you got a Charizard? What do you know about that? You know, I'm just connecting with them. And I remember once one of the other teachers came by my class and they were kind of marveling at how I was just interacting with the kids and everybody was having a good time. And he goes, how do you know this stuff? You know, so what's going on in their classrooms is a totally different energy than what I was trying, what I was, you know, relating to the students. And I never really internalized kind of like it's that little asterisk I have next to the way I teach is that I feel like I can connect with kids in a different way than other people. So um, not having that in my life, I don't know if I could do kids books. I don't know if I could be in a space kind of writing content that connects with them if I was just... I don't know if, if you've talked to other uh, kids authors and <laughs> have you seen this, you go, wait, this is the guy that does this. He doesn't seem like somebody who would do kids books, you know, and, it, and, and it's not so much that I have to be wearing like dinosaur T-shirts and mismatched socks. I don't have to be a, I don't have to be weird, a weirdo. You know what I mean? But it's just I don't know if that makes sense. Like if you if you've seen that, it's like I don't really get the connection. Where is this coming from? Right. That you're, you know, writing kids books. You don't seem like somebody who would do that. Anyway, so yeah, the teaching part has been really important to me and just being in a space where you can kind of understand the language of children. As I was, again, going back to that thing where uh, kids are a lot smarter than we give them credit for, that also is a part of it. Because I was going to say, in, in Leon, there's a lot of 
focus on, as you said, imagination, which is so important, uh, social interactions, and also, you know, education as far as, and also, you know, the, the fun right. story as well. But how important is it for you to have these aspects in a story in a world where so many kids now are just getting their entertainment from mm -hmm. an iPad mm -hmm. or, you know, not really using their imagination as much as maybe um, you know what children. I've been I've been battling that in a way in a way and this is interesting that as we just spoke about Scholastic and some of the other publishers that are producing uh, uh, middle grade content we'll just talk about middle grade for a second is so successful so to look at that somebody's reading this stuff yeah. right so maybe the intention isn't really to like try to grab a kid who doesn't, who only wants to play, you know, NBA 2K and, you know, focus on the kids that are, you know, they grew up in a house full of readers. You know, if you have kids and a thing we do in our, in our house on Sundays is we read, then you're a reader and then you want more content because you already read. It will be great for me to pull in some of those kids who aren't into that. That's really one of my big goals. I want, you know, I just want kids, I think kids need to read more. Um, but I, I don't want to focus on trying to grab another audience that's not there already. Um, but it's real. And I've had these conversations with other cartoonists about like, well, what is our mission now? Because they'll tell you outside that kids don't read, right? They'll tell you, oh, kids don't read. Kids don't read. But yeah, somebody's reading this stuff, you know? So I think there's really two audiences. And I think it, it really has to go back to parenting or whatever, however your house runs. Right. Uh, so, you know, if I'm going, if I'm doing a signing and a bunch of families show up who are interested, they're already there. You know what I mean? It's, I think it's a little different for me having to be on a sidewalk, holding up a book and going, Hey, do you like books? You want to read a book? Like that's a whole other fight. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I think, I think it is important to pay attention to that, but I also know that the audience does exist. You know, and I got to say, you know, as a thank you as a parent for the books you write, but also it's not just about getting kids into comics, but it's getting the kids into reading. Yeah. And because that's such an important skill. And there's so much information out there that you can get through books that you can't get anywhere else. Uh, yeah. When you're doing these signings and you have kids coming up and they're so excited to, to meet you and so excited about the books, what kind of thrills that for you, you know, being able to be part of oh, that? Oh, it's it's... <sighs> If I could say that that's my favorite part, I think some people would go, what about drawing the stuff or, you know, you, I don't know, like the journey. I, I feel like the, the payoff of doing something that somebody connects to is so, it's such, it's so enriching and it's so, I don't know, it's kind of like a runner's high or something like that, that I can't really put in words. Um, and then, you know, better yet, if somebody shows up like cosplaying as Leon or something, that's a whole other brain bomb but it feels like that's what it's all about that's what you know that's what makes us all worth it uh, the, uh going back a little bit um when i was promoting fistic knife gun or i get called up every blue moon to do some sort of like social justice conversation uh one moderator said to me before a panel jamar I just wants you to know that i read fistic knife gun and i cried my eyes out and i went yes <laughs> i was like yeah i did it like that's a win for me like you connected to this work so kind of going back to kids being excited about it i feel like that's the that is the whole reason that i'm doing this stuff is that i got a, i got a connection from someone now let's say one day dc marvel image comes up to you and says how would you like to write a superhero book sure one of the big ones are there mm -hmm. any heroes that you love to dig into or any of your favorites that you love to take a crack at uh I, you know i'm a giant spider-man guy i feel like I don't want to say that all of the Spider-Man stories have been told, especially with what they're doing with the, like the multiverse stuff, which I think is really interesting. Um, I would love to do some Spider-Man work. I think there's always something to connect to with, with Peter and not even, I think people will be uh, surprised to go, Oh, you don't want to write miles. Like people are writing miles already. Um, I I've been into these, I don't know. They're kind of like, I don't know, failed, film students who have like youtube channels where they just kind of dissect movies and this one guy was really about the sam raimi spider-man movies and he was talking about what makes peter parker work and how you know this one was too much of this and not enough of that and then andrew garfield's with this and not enough of that and one of the things that i love about like 
died in a wool Peter Parker is that he doesn't he 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 hardly wins. Like he's always on the edge of everything falling apart. And I think that's the best. That's that's the creamy nougat of Spider-Man to me, you know, and I would love to just kind of write stories in that vein. But yeah, I'd do, that would be Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be yeah, cool. He's such a fertile yeah. <laughs> character. I, I don't want to call him a fertile character. But <laughs> <laughs> there's so much, there's such fertile ground to cover uh, yeah. with Peter Parker because yeah, you're right. You know, you, if he wins, that's that's wrong. It, it doesn't fit. Right. And so always being on the edge of figuring something out, but always, what is it like a, you know, two steps forward, one step back, yes. or even one step forward, two steps back. That's even more challenging, but and interesting. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I get where, where the Spider-Man love it, comes and, from. Uh, and also what I think is cool about them, even though there's been other teen superheroes, it's, it's different or it feels like it's like, you know, Peter Parker adjacent, you know, let's make right. a new guy. But he's got a different name, but he goes through the same stuff. There's something really special about about Peter Parker. I don't know what it is, but it connects with people. Yeah. Agreed. Um, so, Jamar, I want to know if you can, I don't know how secretive uh, anything is, but if you have any projects coming up that we can uh, be on the lookout for, our, our listeners can uh, sure. you know, follow along and and dive into sure this is a perfect time to talk about my scholastic deal so um my newest well my newest project is i have a a series at scholastic graphics uh which is all about leon so the first book uh is coming out this october i'm very excited you guys we're super close uh the first book is called leon the extraordinary uh which will be uh wherever books are sold and the street date is october 4th uh, where I'm basically starting off to to give a little, no, it's not even a spoiler, it's just what it is. Uh, this is kind of like the origin story of Leon, which I think a lot of people will really enjoy and connect with. And um, there's layers to this onion. Uh, one of the interesting things that is, that's happened since I've been promoting the book and talking about people is that <clears throat> the, on the cover is Leon. Look, there's Leon on the thing. It's all like Leon. But once you read the book, it's like, oh, there's other characters in this. Um, you know, much like Protect of the Playground, there's a lot of different characters in there that bounce off of Leon that I find are just as exciting as the main character. So I'm excited for people to um, uh, delve into this universe. There's a lot of really rich things in there. And there's also a lot of good messages in there. And again, it's not heavy handed. It's not preachy. Um, Leon is, you know, he doesn't have it all figured out. He's, you know, 11. Who has it figured out when they're 11? And I try to really stay, um, keep that in the back of my mind that, you know, he might mess up. Maybe, you know, he might be a meanie, but he doesn't mean it. You know, all that's all that stew that's swirling around in, in you when you're that age. I want to kind of put out, put in him so for people to connect with. And I think you're going to love it. And then right after that, I have another Leon book. I'm, I'm working on book two right now. It's behind me. And then I book three and, you know, we'll go from there. So I'm not going anywhere, you guys. A lot of Leon's coming. A lot of Leon. <laughs> well, we, we, we certainly look forward to it and our kids do as oh, well. Thank you. Um, I think we both have kids that are not 11, but approaching uh, mm. a little too quickly for our taste. I'm yeah. sure. Uh, I can speak for Warren as well. Um, so, yeah, this is, a, this is a great series. I'm glad it's going to have a lot longer life. Thank you. Ahead of thank it. you. Thank you. I'm very excited. And it's just, you know, being in this space, uh, I'm very uh, fortunate. I'm humble, but I also I work really hard in this. And this, and this is why I'm here. <laughs> so I hope you enjoy it. Served, uh, you know, all the, the attention you're getting and, the, the you know, this new thing with Scholastic. I mean, it's, you've worked hard and you deserve all of the success. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> More to come. Yes. <laughs> so where can fans, uh, listeners, viewers follow you, uh, social media, websites, other other places for, you know, the latest and greatest? Uh, all right. So I have a website as uh, jamarnicholas.com. Uh, I'm probably the most um, it's funny. I've been kind of like sliding back from social media, but I'm going to have to press press one. Uh, I have a new Instagram. They nuked my original Instagram account. I wish it was for a reason. It's just, you know, the algorithms got me. I don't know what happened. So my new Instagram uh, account is Jamar underscore Nicholas underscore cartoonist. Uh, and then I also have a Twitter, which is at Jamar Nicholas. So yeah, uh, come check me out. And I also do some podcasting uh, like we 
we spoke about a little earlier. Or did we talk about that? Maybe we didn't talk about that. I think we did pre recording. So let's, <laughs> let's get it out there now. Sorry, now we're on about tape. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, I have a couple of weekly podcast projects. One is called Pencil to Pencil. Uh, you can find that on YouTube uh, at just type in pencil to pencil, which I do with uh, comic book masterminds, Mike Manley and Steve Conley, uh, where we talk about the art form and also uh, um, interview other cartoonists. Uh, and then I also have this thing called Coffee Break with JM, which on Thursdays at 9 p.m. EST, I come right here like this. This is like the safe space in this box right here. And I drink a cup of coffee and run my mouth. There you go. <laughs> it's a, it's a it's a really fantastic community. We have regulars, and it's a really interesting dialogue every week. You should check it out. And we are back. Um, like I said, really interesting interview, guys. I you did a great job with him. He seems like just the coolest guy to talk to. Um, and I really found you know what he had to say very interesting. Afterwards, I had to start going in and looking back at his work beyond what I had known previously. So. Any interview that we do and you learn something from is an absolute success. And this was a home run. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, he's uh, one of the coolest guys we've spoken to. I hope he comes up to New York soon. Uh, I think he's someone we'd like to chat with even more, uh, get to know. Um, but I'm looking forward to the new uh, Leon book coming out. My kids are looking forward to it. And I'm sure it's, it's going to be a home run. Yeah, it's great that uh, Jamar is blowing out the Leon universe and you know this this partnership with Scholastic and I think it's going to be an absolute home run like Oren said so uh couldn't happen to a nicer guy we're looking forward to it please uh have your kids and yourselves if you like look out for those Leon books and um thank you for listening thank you for viewing thank you for being here thank you for rating reviewing subscribing telling your friends telling your enemies telling your frenemies telling everybody you can fathom about the Dollar Bin Bandits podcast. We'll put a pin in it. That's it for this week. We'll see you next time. Bye.